this is more of a topical study, seeing as I'm only doing this for one day. Um, so have your finger in the book of Acts, the first chapter also. Uh, we'll be going through that quite a bit. Um, the, the title of this, is it, it, this whole study is about the Holy Spirit and how he's sort of forgotten among the Trinity. And so let's begin with a word of prayer. If you bow your heads, uh, Father, please give us willing hearts to receive the wisdom hidden in your word to those who desire to obtain of its treasures. Let this teaching be solely of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I started about two months ago when Chuck asked me if I would fill in while he's going to be on vacation. Um, I started searching for what I was going to study what I was going to research, what I was going to prepare for, and um, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Uh, I started reading in Galatians, and I really never got out of the first verse. It was a, it was a dead stop right after the first verse. So I'm going to read it to you. In Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, I have blown through these introductions before and because I want the meat, you know. But in this introduction, what I noticed was he wanted to make it very clear that he was chosen by God, by Jesus Christ, and not by men. And it seemed as, he, as if he was defending his authority as an apostle. Um, if you look in the New Living Translation, it's even stronger. It, said, it says, This letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority, but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. He's making it very clear. It was very important to Paul to stress that he was not chosen by man, but by God. So that the, fo so that the followers of Christ knew that he did have apostolic authority. And not just in Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, but in 9 out of 13 of his epistles. He wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament maybe 14 if, if you count Hebrews. But in 9 of the 13, he claims it this way. He claims to be an apostle. In 3 of the 13, he claims to be a bondservant. Um, and in some, he claims to be in a combination of things. Now, to be a clear about this, the other apostles would never have chosen Paul, would they? Because he wasn't Paul then. He was Saul, right? He was not anybody that was desirable that anybody would choose to pick. But at the time <clears throat> the, of the book of Acts, at the beginning of what we know today as the church, right after Jesus ascended into heaven, there were only 11 apostles because Judas commit suicide. And while the apostles were following the instructions of Jesus, before he ascended, they uh, were instructed to return to Jerusalem and wait for the Spirit. In Luke twenty four forty nine, it says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And then in Acts, which you might want to keep open to chapter 1 because we're going to be there a lot. Acts 1.4, it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jew Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. Now this is important in verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Remember that, not many days if you skip ahead to verse 8, it says, But you shall receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witness 
to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. These were direct commands of Jesus before he ascended. Now, while the disciples waited to receive the Holy Spirit, not many days from now, they chose a follower of Jesus to take Judas Iscariot's place. I bet most of you don't know who that is. We don't know. Matthias, yes. Very good, Mark. <laughs> you get the award. It's, but we don't read about him after that, right? So in Acts 1.15, and I'm going to go all the way to verse 26 here. It says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. All together the number of names was about 120, he said. Men and brethren... This scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now skipping ahead to verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. That's the 120 that he was speaking of. Beginning from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and as Mark said, Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now Peter is quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting from the book of Psalms as he says. Um, there are two Psalms. They're not, it's not out of the same Psalm. In Psalm 69, 25, he says, it says, let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents. And then he pulls out of Psalm 109, 8, let his days be few and let another take his office. He's using scripture to justify his decision, to justify the choice of this this new apostle that they're bringing on. And it's important that we use Scripture because Scripture was written by the Holy Spirit through man's hand. But it was it was led, the words in our in our Bible were led by the Holy Spirit and put down. So they also prayed to God for guidance in this decision. Um, That's very important to pray. They chose two good men, too. I mean, you think about it. These two guys were with them the whole time from the, from in the beginning of Jesus' ministry with John the Baptist, right? All the way through to where he ascended. So they got to sit in on his teaching. And so it's nothing against these two guys. They were good men. And there was good reason for the apostles to, to choose them. But in the end... They cast lots. Now, I don't know, we don't cast lots today, but we do similar things, right? Um, casting lots was mentioned 70 times in the Old Testament and only seven times in the New Testament. In spite of all the references, it doesn't really say in the Bible what it is exactly. Um, nothing is known about these lots exactly. So they could have been sticks that were various lengths that you would draw. It could have been a flattened stone that would flip like flipping a coin. It could be some kind of dice. We don't know. Um, This practice was used in the Old Testament and it was accepted by God. But what they didn't know was that in a few days they would have the Holy Spirit They didn't understand that because 
they were using an Old Testament technique in a time where they were ch- things were changing, where God brought Jesus down to this earth so that we could see God in flesh. We could witness God in flesh. But Jesus was leaving, and he was replacing himself with something better, with something that pointed to him but could be in every one of us. They didn't wait for the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit. So, in John 16, 13, it says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now, most commentators that I've read, the ones that I trust, um, would disagree with what I'm, with what I'm going to say, and this is not a dogmatic thing, but it seems to me that the lack of the Holy Spirit at the time of this decision and the dominance of Paul in the New Testament, because he dominates the New Testament, would indicate that Paul is the twelfth apostle. Um, in Revelation 21.14, Jesus is describing this. Uh, it says, Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Not thirteen, but twelve. Um, the canon of Scripture shows us the importance of Paul. He, like I said before, he wrote 13 of the 27 books, maybe 14. The book of Acts, which we went through with Pastor Chuck not that long ago, is the Acts of the Apostles. But how many apostles do you really hear about in the book of Acts? Peter dominates chapters 1 through 12 and chapters 13 through 28. Paul is the main focus in the book of Acts. Um, now here's the kicker why would God choose Paul to be an apostle to our worldly vision and our experience Paul was a horrible person just let's call him Saul because this is before he was changed no Christian would have ever seen the potential in Saul that God did he persecuted Christians he caused them to blaspheme he, con- he consented to put them to death. We remember Stephen. He held the clothes <clears throat> while, they, while he watched them stone an innocent man. Now Paul confesses in Acts 22.20, 20, And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. There is no reason to believe that the apostles would have ever wanted to work with this guy. We get guys in work, at work where I work. I build cabinets. And there's a lot of times I don't want to work with those guys either. <laughs> you know, it's like, who hired this guy? <laughs> oh, that's right. I was in on that. Um, but, but imagine how bad it was for the apostles. It, it just it blows my mind. But we have to remember that God's ways are not our ways. His ways, we don't understand them. We can't understand them. Not on this side of heaven. But in Isaiah 55, 8, he does tell us this. So at least we can understand that this is truth. We don't understand his ways. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God had to choose Paul. Paul is the greatest conversion story in the history of this world. Nobody, nobody has excuse to say, I'm not good enough to be saved. If Paul is good enough to be saved, everyone in here is good enough to be saved. If he had went with Matthias, we would be open to excuses. Because what other, what other apostle is our example? 
We can't use Judas. He commits suicide. He wasn't saved. He's in hell. Paul was a literal antichrist of the time. We can't say, I'm too bad. We can't say, oh, I better wait till I get cleaned up. We can't say, oh, you don't know what I've done. They're no good. Satan has no hold of you by his accusations. If you're thinking these reasons are yours, you are without excuse. God chose Saul of Tarsus to be Paul the Apostle. God can save anyone as long as you come to him and give your life to his son Jesus. He is our Savior and our Redeemer. We can stand in victory by standing in Christ. So this is my roundabout way of getting to the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We have an advantage over those who live during the 33 or so years that between Christ's birth and his ascension after the resurrection. I know that's hard to believe. I have sat there and thought to myself, I wish that Jesus Christ could be sitting here next to me to straighten me out on some things, to give me some advice, that the physical presence was there, right? But Jesus says in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. It is difficult to think that we're better off since he went away, but there are reasons why. Think about this. When Jesus was alive on this earth, and he was in, in the area of Israel, if he was in Galilee, could he be in Jerusalem? What if he was in Jerusalem? Could he be in China? Could he be in, name it, anywhere else on this world? Could he be there? He was a man that was in one place, right? He couldn't be everywhere at once. He had to walk places. He had to travel. I mean, he did some pretty cool methods of travel, walking on water and things like that, but, but he wasn't everywhere at once, right? Could he be in St. Joseph if he was over in Kansas City? No, he can't. But today, he is. Through the third person, and I'm saying person, of the Trinity. And don't delude yourself into thinking that when he divides himself that he's any less. He is not deluded down. He is just as much in every one of you through the Holy Spirit than he is, than he was when he was actually standing here. He can't be split apart into anything less. The main job of the Holy Spirit is to bear witness of Jesus Christ and what he did on this earth and what his teachings were. The whole Bible points to Jesus Christ. Now think about this. We know that the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible, right? But it's written by 40 different authors over hundreds and hundreds of years. Imagine if we just took 40 of us in here and say, okay, you're going to write something. And we're going to put it all together and we're going to make a book. And it's got to be cohesive. It's got to agree. Heather can't write something different than Marty that disagrees with it. It all has to work together. But now we're going to split it up and, uh, you know, maybe Marty's great-grandchild is going to write something when he's gone. And maybe he hasn't seen what Marty wrote. That's the way the Bible is. Think about it. The Bible is split up over all of those writers and all those years that the Holy Spirit has to be the author of it. Because what good would it be? It would be a hodgepodge of nothing. It would, be, it would make no sense. So 
we have a complete Bible, a protected Bible, and an inerrant Bible. In Matthew 5.18, Jesus says, For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. That is dotting the I's and crossing the T's. That's how accurate your Bible is. You can have confidence in it. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13, he says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual the worldly spirit can never understand the ways of God. It's undesirable for them, for the people who don't know God, to understand the ways of God. They don't want to know. It's also unattainable. Without the spirit, you could open your Bible up and you cannot make sense of it. You have to have the spirit to teach you. The unsaved man can never understand the Bible or the Christian believer. Now, what are we without the Holy Spirit? The next verse, 14, explains, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. We have to have the Spirit to know the things of God. Some of the things that the Spirit does for us is He convicts us of sin. He guides us in truth. He regenerates us. He leads us. And He sanctifies us. He empowers us. He teaches us. And this is really important. And we saw it last weekend here. He brings unity to us. When we have our outreach, and there's so many people involved in so many things, whether you're bringing hot dogs or whether you're downstairs counseling people or whether you're cooking or you're walking outside in the streets just talking to people, there's a unity, there's a commonness that we have. Our culture loves diversity, right? You know what's great about diversity? Is we may all look different, we may all act different, but there's a unity that brings together all of that. We don't need to point out our differences. We need the unity of the Holy Spirit. I mean, how is it that, it, I mean, when you talk about teaching, he teaches us. How is it that a child in my Sunday school class, which is fifth through eighth grade, is able to discern a parable? Jesus taught it. The Pharisees were there. The religious leaders, they couldn't understand it. Were they uneducated? They were the top dogs. They had the scrolls. They read it. They should have known. They didn't know. They were blind and dumb. They were the elite of the time, but they were blind and dumb. When we love Jesus, He gives us the Holy Spirit and He opens our eyes to reveal His mysteries to us. In Luke eleven thirteen, 13, it says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? All we have to do is ask. That's it. You don't have to be special. You don't have to do anything special. You just have to ask. God, lead me. How much easier can it be? I mean, can you imagine the joy it brings to our Father in heaven? I think about the joy it brings to me when my student actually did get the parable. That made me so happy. When I teach somebody something down there and one of these little kids gets it and they get excited, it just, it's exciting to me. Imagine how excited God is to know The Holy Spirit, unfortunately, though, has received a bad rap 
because we have a lack of understanding of him. I want to read to you about this study that the Barna Group, they surveyed, uh, that they did, uh, I think it was in 2009, they surveyed 1,871 self-described Christians about their viewpoints on God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, Satan, and demons. While 78% said that God is an all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe who rules the world today, 58% believe that the Holy Spirit is a symbol of God's power or presence, but is not a living entity. 59% also believe that Satan is not a living being, but is a symbol of evil. Now, I wish I could agree with that. I know it's not true, but man, it'd be a lot easier to deal with it if he was just a symbol, right? Kathy wouldn't have a flat tire on her car this morning that I had to go pick her up 10 minutes before this started, right? But the Holy Spirit is not a power or a force. He's a person. He is a person of the Trinity, he is no less than Jesus. He's no less than the Father. He is a co-equal part of the Trinity. He has power and force, but we don't experience him through our traditional senses. He can't be touched or tasted. We can't smell him. He communicates through our hearts. We know him in ways that cannot be explained by the words of this world. He whispers to us in inaudible voices. We have to discern his presence. And honestly, I got to say right now, we are so numb to that discernment in our society. We have 24 hour news. Who needs to know the news 24 hours? Right? I don't need to know it for 10 minutes because it just is upsetting. I mean, you got CNN, you got Fox News, you got MSNBC, CNBC. It's unnecessary. But it's this constant barrage of information, information, right? We got Facebook. I mean, I don't even need to say anything about Facebook. <laughs> and Twitter, we definitely won't go there. But we have our smartphones. Texting, Messenger, Skype. You can't get away. It's always, it's just constant. Radio, television, Netflix. Video games. I'm going to get Pokemon Go. It's like, look up. You might get hit by a car. Minecraft. If anybody's ever seen a child with Minecraft, that could put a child, you wouldn't even see him for days. And then all the death games. I mean, they're out there. This world's full of them just shooting this and shooting that and killing this and killing that, and we are so desensitized to it. And you got 24-7 sports coverage, right? I mean, you could turn the radio on and hear about a game that happened four days ago like it just happened a half an hour ago. Boring. Um, anyways, this is the world we live in today. This isn't the world that Charles Spurgeon lived in. This isn't the world where... They didn't have access to media like we do, but it desensitizes us. We can't hear the Holy Spirit because there's a constant barrage of information. We can't get alone. We can't get quiet. We have to seek that out. You have to go completely against the way the world is going in order to do this. It is nothing but a distraction. It's not, the, this part of the world is not important. If 58% of the Christians in this survey don't believe the Holy Spirit exists, then throw out the book of Acts because they talk about him a lot. I would throw out all the epistles. I mean, might as well just throw out the whole New Testament. What good is it if you're not going to believe what it says? The world sees God as a figment of our imagination, as the boogeyman. That's not what he is. What dominates this world as reality is a stage set by God 
for the sole purpose of the redemption of our human souls by the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed for us on the cross. I'm here to tell you today that the Spirit is more real and he's more tangible than the world that we see. I'll give you an example. If I told you that this building that we're sitting in right now was not real, you would think I was nuts. You would say, of course it's real. Look at the windows. Look at the pretty stained glass. Look at the ceiling. Look at the peeling paint. Look at the pews that are holding you up. But I'm telling you, I'd be more right than you. In a blog written by Kelly Klein, Ph.D., a professor of astronomy and mathematics at Carroll College, he claims that solid objects are mostly empty space. In 1909, an astonishing experiment was performed in the laboratory of the English physicist Ernest Rutherford. A beam of alpha radiation particles was fired at a sheet of gold foil. Most of the alpha particles went straight through the sheet of gold foil. However, to everyone's surprise, a few of them bounced back. Why didn't they all go through? Why did a few of them come back? Based on this strange experiment, Rutherford proposed a new idea of what an atom is. Rutherford said that most of an atom is empty space, where negatively charged electrons orbit. The only solid part of an atom is the nucleus, where the positively charged protons are found. You can put that slide up, Jacob. To give an analogy of this, I can compare an atom of gold to our solar system. While there are two very different sizes, we can't see an atom. Our solar system is huge. We can compare them relatively. If we could shrink the solar system down to where the sun was one foot in radius, the planet Pluto would be 1.6 miles away. One foot in radius. The furthest planet is 1.6 miles away. There's nothing in between, right? Except maybe other planets. But you look out into space at night, it's empty space. Very little in there. Now, in comparison, if we could enlarge the nucleus of gold, just one atom of gold, to a foot in radius, about the size of a big basketball, the outermost electron would be 3.3 miles away. So like maybe out by the North Belt Walmart or something, right? There's nothing in between. This is twice the distance of what's in our solar system. So everything in between is empty space. It is 99 point, 12 6% empty, to be exact. While the electrons in this hickory stand here repel the electrons in my hand and the atoms bond together in such a way to reflect the light so I can see this and I can feel it, Nonetheless, it's mostly empty space. Now, in saying all this, my purpose is to establish in you that the things that we can sense and see are truly as mysterious as the things that we cannot see and we, ca we have trouble sensing. It may be difficult to understand the Trinity and the Holy Spirit's place in it, but we need to accept it. If we can accept that this is not empty space because God wants us to see it that way and because he designed the atom and because he made it look like hickory, then we can accept that the Holy Spirit is real. Remember as I quoted earlier, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We must accept not through blind faith, but through real faith backed up by the inerrant word of God that the Holy Spirit is more real than this world that we live in. He is the person of the Holy Spirit. He is not an essence or an impersonal force. He's not, he has a personality. 
In order to have a personality, one must have three things. One, you've got to have a will. I'm not talking about what you leave to your kids. I'm talking about your will to have a personality. The Holy Spirit is in charge of dispersing gifts. Did you know that? The gifts that you get, he is in charge of dispersing them to you. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, it says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Number two, he has to have intelligence, right? If he's going to teach us. The Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God and teaches us. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of, of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words, which man's wisdom teaches us, teaches, but with the Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. He has to have intelligence to teach us. He has to know the things of God. He knows Jesus Christ better because he is part of the Trinity and he always points to Jesus Christ. The third thing that he has to have to have a personality is emotions. He loves us. He loves each and every one of us. Even before we're saved, he's trying to get us saved, right? Right? He's, he's convicting you of sin. He loves us, but we can vex him and we can grieve him too. We can hurt him. In Romans 5.5 5 it says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. In Isaiah 63.10 it says, getting on to the vexing, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. And also in Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. If the Holy Spirit were an impersonal force or power or some, of some sort, we could not call upon him in our time of need. We could not be loved by him. But because he is a person, we can have a relationship with him. We can commune, commune with him. In the last verse of 2 Corinthians 13, 14, it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. He speaks to us. In Acts 13, 2, it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. It says the Holy Spirit said. In 1 Timothy 4, 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And also in Revelation 2.7, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He teaches us. In John 14.26, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance, bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. He intercedes for us. In Romans 8.26, it 
says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. This is the hardest one here. He convicts us of sin, doesn't he? Sometimes sin that we don't know we have. Sometimes it's sin that we know that we have. In John 16, 8, it says, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. I felt his conviction just about this. When I started studying and preparing to fill in for Chuck several weeks ago, I was pretty excited about the opportunity to fill in for him. I was excited that he asked me. I prepared for this for 40 or 50 hours trying to come up with enough material because you guys know your Bibles. If I stand up here and I don't do my work, I'm in trouble. Um, I prayed a lot. I sought advice from Pastor Pat. I sought advice from Pastor Chuck, from Marty. I have talked to a lot of people. I um, thought I was doing everything right. One day I was walking up the basement stairs, and I spent a lot of time in the basement, as these three ladies can tell you, <laughs> my woodworking crew. <laughs> um, but I was convicted. God asked me, are you doing this for me, or are you doing this for you? Well, if God asked me that, why would he ask me that if I was doing it for him, right? I mean, he kind of answered his own question. So, what do I say? It's like, you know God. Humble me. That's a prayer I don't want to pray. I was talking to Mark on the phone the other day. We were talking about humbling. How do you pray to be humbled? Nobody wants that because what was the word you came up with? Yeah. Humiliation is a derivative of the word humble. Nobody wants to ask for that. But I had to ask for it. I need to ask that one a lot. Um, but I'm glad he did. If I do anything for the love of Christ being led by the Holy Spirit, he will bless it. If I do it of my own accord, it will not be blessed. It will be burned up. It will be worthless. Why even do it? My favorite attribute of him, he's my comforter. My parakletos. I hope I said that right. Did I say that right? <laughs> okay. He's my consoler. He's my advocate and my comforter. In the King James of John 14, 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. But he calls him the Comforter. In Acts 9, 31, it says, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Now, to close this out, I want to say, as a Christian, and I know most of you, we're powerless without the Holy Spirit. We're, we're spinning our wheels. We have to have the Holy Spirit. It's not well, if you want them, you can have them, but, you know, I'm okay. I've been to church every Sunday. I've done my time. That's not what it's about. If you're doing time, you're wasting time. There's no point in it. God doesn't respect it. He doesn't respect you showing up. It's your heart. And the problem is you can't hide your heart from him, right? It's not really a problem. It's important. But he knows why you're here. He knows what your motives are. He knows everything. He knew what my motives were, and he made me feel pretty bad about it, as I should have, because it is sin. He convicts us of sin. He doesn't want us 
to keep sinning, whatever that sin is. It's just not an option as a Christian to be filled with the Holy Spirit is a must. He's our direct communication with God. We're in a battlefield. Would you go out into war without communication with the generals, with the the higher-ups? You'd be dead in no time at all. You'd be lost. He's our lifeline. In Acts 6, 1 through 3, it says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve apostles called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word and serve tables. Remember that, serving tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. He wanted people who serve tables to have the Holy Spirit. How important is that to him? It's not just because Chuck has to have the Holy Spirit or Pat has to have it because they're teaching something. That's not the point. The point is if you're vacuuming in here, if you're outside taking care of the yard, all these things, you don't know when you need that Holy Spirit upon you because there are people that we come into contact with all the time that we have to talk to. And if I'm out there cutting the grass and I run over a beer bottle and I'm cussing it out because some drunk was walking by there and threw it in there and it gets in my lawnmower, where's my witness? The Holy Spirit has to be with everybody. Stephen has a big chunk in Acts. He was serving tables, right? He was important to God. He knew his Bible. He told it like it was. Paul wouldn't be Paul if it hadn't been for Stephen. Think about that. Stephen's witness. If we have him today, we need him again tomorrow. A Christian without the Holy Spirit is like that unemployed 40-year-old that still lives in his mother's basement and she makes him meatloaf and does his laundry. We don't want to be that person, right? I don't want to be that. I don't like that person. I've known those people. Nobody likes them. The Holy Spirit is that important. A church without the Holy Spirit cannot be effective. Programs and entertainment, and smoke machines during worship, and what, whatever it is. It can't replace the power of the Holy Spirit. A church without the power of the Holy Spirit is pointless. It's a club. Mark, if you want to come up. I just want to close out with this and say, if there is unconfessed sin in your life, take care of it today. Don't keep long accounts as far as sin in your life. If you don't know what it is, ask God. The Holy Spirit convicts you, right? If I regard iniquity in my life, God will not hear me. Unrepentant, unconfessed sin is the fire extinguisher that, this, that Satan uses to put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. It will quench it. You won't hear. If you don't know Christ and you haven't given your life to Him, let today be the day. Don't wait. Let today be the day of salvation. You don't know if you have tomorrow. God never guaranteed that you're going to walk out of here and have tomorrow. I've been in a car wreck. I thought my life was over. I was in my 30s when it happened. You don't know when that guy's going to come around the corner and wipe you out. Don't take it for granted. In 2 Corinthians 6-2, he quotes from Isaiah 49-8. He says, For he says, 
In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You can come up and pray with us here to accept Christ's sacrifice on the cross. It is worthy. His sacrifice was worthy to get you saved if you're not. He will forgive your sin so that you can spend eternity in heaven overflowing with God's unending love. If you've already given your life to Christ, then I ask that you pray with me now to receive a renewal of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you guys want to come up front with anybody that wants to pray, the people I've talked to, Marty and and just sit up here, that would be great. And Wanda. There are people up here you can pray with. In Luke eleven thirteen, as I said before, it says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He loves us more than any human ever could, and we all, all we have to do is ask. If you want a refilling of the Holy Spirit in your life, if you're a saved Christian and you want that, you want the Holy Spirit to contact you, to talk to you, to be able to hear Him, you can come up here and pray, and we can all pray with you and ask that you receive a refilling of the Holy Spirit. And if you've never received Him, it could be a new filling of the Holy Spirit, but you have to be refilled. You don't put gas in your car the day you buy it and expect it to run until the thing's dead, right? You have to refill it. So if we could all bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that your Holy Spirit will come upon this church in a mighty and powerful way. I pray we will be refreshed and renewed to follow you closer so that each day we are conformed more and more to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that you will fill each and every believer in this building with your overflowing of love and joy to where we have to say, as D.L. Moody said, we can't handle it anymore for we should die. I pray that you will convict our hearts and point us to Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen.